Hey, everybody. Um, hope you're doing well. We can go ahead and get started. Lynette is here today. Um, so if you have questions, send them to her. I'm making her co-host, so she'll pop to the top of the participants list. And after I kind of go over my announcements, um, I'll pause for a moment and take any additional questions. So you can start sending them to her now. Um, in case you have questions about last Tuesday's content, any of the class stuff, or um, last Thursday's content. So, um, yeah, questions about Aspen, McCabe Thiele, basics. We're going to do more of that today. So, um, if you need any clarifications before we jump in, do, do ask questions. And today we should be able to get through the remaining content on distillation, in, uh, including advanced distillation concept with multiple components beyond two. And then some more sophisticated analysis with um, the graphical methods, things like partial condensers and side draws. I did just want to um, do a couple of reminders. Number one, I will not have office hours this Wednesday, uh, 520. I have a meeting with the dean that I has been scheduled since before the quarter started. So I, um, if you want an additional office hour from me this week, just go ahead and send me an email and we can schedule it. And you know, the TAs will be having the regular office hours. And wanted to quickly review with the class the remaining amount of material, just so you're all uh, on the same page. Everything that you've turned in up until this point has been graded, and that comprises around 52% um, percent of the class material. So the remaining stuff and when it's due um, is as follows. Homework 4 is due this week. Hopefully you know that. Quiz 4 is this Friday. I hope you all saw Jeremy's announcement um, of some needed data for quiz four. We're trying to do everything we can to help you guys be successful. And so um, follow Jeremy's instructions in terms of getting ready to use that data on the quiz and it'll help you um, get through the material quicker and spend more time um, just thinking and working on the problem. You have another quiz next Friday. Uh, quiz five will be next Friday. Then one more homework assignment. Um, due June 3rd and a sixth quiz due June 5th and our project for the class is due Monday June 8th so that is the um, bulk of material that's left and um, you know reach out in any ways that we can help you I updated the learning objectives and schedule uh, of readings to kind of match where I think we're going to get in the rest of the class um, so you can take a look at that and I'll also note that we have a special guest lecture next week, um, or maybe the week after next, I don't remember. Um, it's one of the alumni from the department who's gonna come talk about his career in Chevron. And he will talk about his work as a process engineer and where separations technology has made an impact in his career. So that should be really exciting and stay tuned for more about that. I'll, I'll be sure to give you more details when I have them. Okay, so I saw already one question come in. I'll answer that and then give you the time to um, ask any more. So somebody asks for the McCabe Thiele analysis, is it possible to use the given value of Q to find the vapor fraction of the feed if you know the feed flow rate? Um, so the answer is certainly yes, um, and I'll show you how to do that. So the question is, can you use Q to find um, the fraction of feed that is vapor? And that would be something like FV over F if we were going to label that the um, the component of the feed that's vapor like that. We had diff slightly different variables in the example of flash. I'm just pulling up the notes on from last week so I can see the exact formula. Give me one moment. This question is really relevant to what we're talking about in class today. So I think it's a good thing to spend a moment on. <clears throat> 
Okay, so we defined in our notes that Q is equal to L bar minus L over F. And remember that L bar is the amount, the liquid flow rate in the um, molar reflux relative to the feed. So at our feed stage, L is coming down and then we add some, some amount FL uh, and then we have down here L bar equals L plus FL. So the amount of feed that's vaporized, you should be able to work backwards from these relationships uh, given knowledge of L. So, so I guess given knowledge of L and given knowledge of Q, you should be able to work backwards and figure out the amount of feed that's vaporized because it's everything that's not added to L bar is um, the amount of feed that's vaporized. So actually, I think this is exactly equal to V over F for cases where it's not super cooled or um, superheated. So um, I wanna think about it a little more in terms of the superheated and super cooled context. But for, um, I'm actually going to erase that right now because I think it's not quite right. For the case where it's a partially uh, vaporized feed, yes, uh, it's the normal Q line from, um, from uh, the flash analysis. And then if it's um, super cool or superheated, I think you have to think about it a little more, but we um, can figure that out as well. So long story short, yeah, you, can, you should be able to do that analysis. I don't see any additional questions coming in about um, distillation analysis. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started in, into our notes for today. And uh, we'll take a break. Let me set my timer. And if you have more questions, you can totally, about my Cape Feely, you can ask it then as well. So in binary distillation, uh, before we jump into multi-component distillation, there's kind of four things I'm going to talk about today in class. So we'll talk about column operating pressure. It's a really important consideration, and you'll you'll see why for a number of reasons. Um, and then we'll talk about different types of condensers, reflux temperature, subcooled reflux. So these first two things are more operational considerations as you think about designing a column and selecting the conditions in which you're going to operate the column. These first two topics would fit there. Then we'll talk about the column energy balance and make sure you're all on the same page about that, as well as the case when you have multiple feeds or side draws. And then after that, we'll spend, take a break and then we'll, we'll talk about multi-component distillation. So um, I'll do this diagram in a second, but just a couple notes here, kind of high points. Um, in your distillation system, if you have uh, really light boiling components. And so that would be components with a very, very low boiling point or components with a very, very high vapor pressure. What that will mean um, is that if you're using just a regular total condenser, the pressure of that system at, uh, it is going to be un quite high. So, you, you know, you can calculate, for example, the, the supposed pressure of a saturated liquid that has like a C2 or a C3 compound, and, and that becomes unrealistic very quickly. So a common error in Aspen is when you use a total condenser and you have uh, a component like methane or oxygen in there, and Aspen can't really calculate the right thermal chemistry to condense that. So part, um, the selection of pressure becomes really important in understanding uh, how you'll build the column and how you'll model it. The other thing that is really important to think about is if you operate kind of at ambient conditions or um, lower pressures, you can lead to very, uh, very high temperatures, which can be unsafe or can damage product in the reboiler. So pressure, um, if pressure is too high, I mean, it, that, that can uh, come up there. So you have to be able to think through the column operating pressure in terms of, of these kind of extremes where the condenser won't operate correctly if you try and do a total condenser, it's not possible. Or you can reach temperatures that are too high and cause problems with degradation of material. So let me just kind of walk you through this. This is figure 716, I think. Um, certainly, it's, it's somewhere in chapter seven. And uh, this kind of gives you a little bit of a logic framework for figuring out how to select the, the pressure of the column. And it begins, of course, you have, you have to know 
the composition that you're going to run your column at. So you've solved the, the mole balance using a graphical method or a process simulator. And then um, it selects a temperature that's higher than ambient, but not too extreme as a kind of, this is heuristic, it's a rule of thumb, so it's not a scientifically derived number, but the recommendation is you would calculate the bubble point pressure. So what is, um, what's the pressure of that saturated liquid at uh, a slightly elevated temperature that's probably common in petrochemical and um, uh, industry. So two kind of decision trees here, if the pressure is higher than uh, 215 PSIA or lower than 215 PSIA. So that's much higher than ambient, right? Um, uh, pressure about, you know, 15 to 20 times higher. And if the pressure is higher, this gets into a regime where um, you need special equipment to operate at very high pressures. You'll discuss this in detail in Chemi 485 next winter, sort of selecting the materials of construction for different unit operations. So, um, Let's take the example here where it, the pressure is higher. So let's say we're in this case where the pressure appears to be too high. Then there's another decision looking at the, um, the dew point pressure. So what's happening if you have a saturated vapor? And then again, asking questions about which pressure regime you're in. So let's say that we had a very light boiling mixture and the dew point pressure was extremely high. Um, what you're gonna do then is have to figure out a refrigerant. So you're not going to do this with chilled water. It's going to be a compressed refrigerant and an operating pressure that we don't typically exceed. This is huge. So your column uh, would then kind of vent a gas, partial condenser, and then you'd have this operating pressure in your condenser uh, of 415 PSIA. Um, there's three other metrics here. So that would guide you through probably three regimes. So under 200, between 200 and 365, and above 365 will then guide you to the selection of how to operate the condenser. That then gives you the ability to turn your attention to the bottom. Uh, and we wanna understand given that selection of a condenser pressure, what pressure would that lead to in the bottom of the column? Then you're gonna look at the material in the bottom of the column and calculate given that pressure, what is the bubble point temperature? That's gonna be the temperature in your reboiler in order to uh, boil that material at that pressure. And then the question there, uh, cause that's where the hottest point in the column is gonna be, uh, is is it above or below some sort of the, the critical point, which you're familiar with from thermodynamics. And then um, we're gonna have a rough metric of decomposition. So we know that material, will, will, all organic material will decompose at a certain temperature. And so we're assuming here, you have some knowledge of, of the temperature in which you would begin to degrade your products. So if that temperature is too high, if you're above critical point or you're above the bottom temperature, um, then you're gonna lower the pressure and kind of work backwards through figuring out um, given this low pressure in the reboiler, how then will my um, condenser uh, conditions change? And obviously you get out of the flow sheet here if your bottom's temperature is below the critical or decomposition temperature, you can move forward. So the point of this, um, you know, I don't want you to memorize every number on this. If I was gonna ask you a question about these specific figures, I'd give you this, this figure, but the concepts are really important in terms of being able to get chemical engineering thinking and apply that to the design of the unit operation. And this is where your knowledge of um, um, not just thermodynamics, but eventually your knowledge of reactor design and kinetics will come in because you're gonna to begin to think about how you operate this unit operation with respect to where compounds will break down, uh, where they will decompose. So hopefully you're beginning to get this uh, bigger appreciation for how all the different pieces in chemical engineering come together to help you be able to analyze a, a complex system. So choice of column pressure, um, you may have to think about it in a future project and just kind of put it in the back of your brain that this is an important thing and this flow chart is really convenient for guiding you through that process. All right, so we've alluded to this a little bit, um, but we kind of have three different types of condensers that, that you will see. You can model all of these in Aspen and you can model all of them with um, the mccabe teeley method. So the first real question, um, is how you're gonna operate a partial versus a total condenser. And as we kind of alluded to just a moment ago, 
you're going to be thinking primarily about the products you have in the distillate, whether it's possible to condense them realistically. And then you're going to be thinking about safety, pressure, and temperature, and those sort of things. Um, chemical engineers wear a lot of hats. You have to think about safety first. You have to think about stewardship of the environment and sustainability. And then you have to think about product quality, in, typically in that order. So all of those things factor in your separation, and all of them may have slightly different answers, and you're going to um, have to sort of always prioritize in that order, in, in my opinion. Then another thing that's um, important to think about, and we're going to kind of cover this next, and then we'll talk about total condensers, is this issue of subcooled reflux. So thinking through this, um, we've had this idea now in our distillation analysis for total condensers that we are 100% condensing all the material. Without much thought about how that would work operationally, you would actually just model that as a saturated liquid. But that only happens if you exactly remove the latent heat of vaporization. So I just wanna point out that that is not really practical you know, these condensers are heat exchangers. They're large, they have high flow rates of materials through them. And there's different, what we call utilities that will be flowing through it. So a plant might have uh, an ultra cold refrigerant. It might have chilled water at different temperatures. There's a bunch of different kind of uh, utilities a, a refinery or chemical plant has. Um, and those utilities are kind of at a fixed temperature. You don't typically change the temperature of that utility. That's what's being given to you by the central plant uh, inside of your individual um, large, large plant. So let's imagine we have a, a refrigerant or a chilled water that's colder than we need in order to do total condensation. Then the reflux is going to become subcooled. And the temperature of the liquid re-entering the column is going to be uh, less than the bubble point. So this is really important to think about because we have this model from our feed stage consideration about what happens when you introduce a subcooled liquid into the column. So let's do a deep dive into that and think about what happens in, in the subcooled reflux con context. Um, so I drew this kind of schematic here. Um, this blue little thing, that's our valve. So our subcooled reflux is entering the top tray right there. So this is tray number one in our column. And what's gonna happen is that the vapor rising from tray one or stage one is gonna become um, condensed because it's a subcooled reflux compared to the saturation temperature. Remember that the composition of that vapor and the composition of that reflux are identical unless we have a partial condenser. And so because the compositions are identical, if the temperature of the liquid's lower, it's gonna directly condense um, some of that vapor. So what that means is there will be an effective internal reflux ratio because we're sort of increasing what we call the effective reflux ratio. And this is important to think about because it will change the slope of our operating line. So, it's derived in more detail in the book, but you can calculate in the binary distillation context with the McCabe-Feely method, you can calculate what is this internal reflux ratio. Um, so this is equation 730 I'm showing here on the screen. And I'm not gonna go through the whole derivation. It, it comes from doing an energy balance around that um, schematic that I just walked you through. But if you just look at the relative components here, it should be uh, at least intuitive how this comes about. So um, what, what we have here is the, um, the regular external reflux ratio R. And then we're, um, we're multiplying that times this quantity one plus this ratio here. And this ratio is the heat capacity of the liquid times the amount of subcooling we have. So that's what delta T subcooling means. Like what is the temperature below the um, um, bubble point? And then we're dividing that by the enthalpy of vaporization of the liquid. So this gives us an idea of the magnitude of how much of the vapor is going to be condensed. And um, yeah, so, so this, uh, again, I'm not worried about you having deep knowledge of the derivation of this. Just know that uh, when the reflux is subcooled, the reflux ratio uh, is effectively increased due to this effect. 
And then that will change the slope of your operating line and, and the subsequent analysis. So somebody just asked a question. Um, if the reflux is subcooled, then the, the distillate is also subcooled, and the answer is yes. So typically, um, we're going to be drawing the distillate, like um, like taking a draw of that from the process, not sketching, but that we call that a draw when we're removing that uh, material stream from the process. We're drawing the distillate kind of at the same point where the reflux is coming out, and that's going to be uh, if you look at the schematics that we talked about on the first day of distillation and the schematics in your book, you often have the condenser, which is a heat exchanger, as well as a reflux drum. And so that reflux drum is just a tank to, again, have liquid hold up there to smooth out process operations. So uh, the distillate will then be subcooled compared to, um, that will be the same temperature for all intents and purposes as the liquid reflux temperature. Uh, so yeah, that's how subcooled reflux works. And basically, if you encounter this situation, what you need to know is that before you draw your operating line for the rectifying section, what you need to do is figure out what the effective or internal reflux ratio is going to be, and then draw the slope of your operating line with that reflux, that effective reflux ratio. I'm just going to wait one second. I see here in my uh, chat window, um, maybe another question coming in. So uh, anyway. Uh, I think we're good. Now let's talk about this uh, kind of more interesting case of the partial condenser and what um, what we do to treat these systems. And we're actually going to do a model or an example problem with a partial condenser so you can begin to appreciate and see how this works in practice. So there's three ways, um, if we're not, um, th that we can imagine running the condenser on our distillation column. So what we've done so far is a pure liquid distillate. We call this total condenser. Um, another thing we can do is just have pure vapor distillate. So that would actually kind of look the same from the point of view of block flow diagram. There's just one stream leaving. We would just label it D because it's distillate. And uh, we would return some liquid reflux to the column. That's always going to happen in distillation. You always have to return liquid reflux or you're not going to be able to um, have mass transfer and like the whole concept will, will fail. And then it's not uncommon as well to just have a, a partial, this could be called a partial or a mixed condenser. And here we have two, two distillate streams. There's a vapor um, stream and a liquid stream. So a really common example of this would be where you're in a refinery and you have a complex mixture of hydrocarbons. And um, through the process of distillation, you separate out a really light boiling stream. So something like hydrogen sulfide, uh, H2 gas, uh, methane, things like that. So in, um, you'll often see when you look at refineries, um, especially at night, this giant stack of flame coming out of the top of a tower, that's called a flare. And what we do, or uh, what, what is done in industry, is that uh, this DV, this vi distillate vapor stream on some columns in the oil refining process is just burned. Uh, you can't, there's no valuable product and um, the company is not required to, you know, control emissions or it's, it's burning at a temperature that uh, just has CO2 and oxygen. So this is always surprising to some students when you, when you learn what a flare is, but um, sometimes there's nothing that can be done with that material. And so the, um, the company is able, be at a loss in that state, to just burn it. So um, again, you still have in the, mix, the mixed condenser, you still have liquid reflux, but now you have a liquid product and vapor product. So the big important point here that we're going to see in this example problem is the following. When you have a partial condenser, this is another spot in the column that is an equilibrium stage. Just like the partial reboiler is an equilibrium stage, the partial condenser in this case also becomes an equilibrium stage. And we have one more thing to think about as we're stepping off stages and drawing um, our mccabe daily diagrams. I see a question coming in, I'll pause a second and then we will jump into this example problem on the next slide. What, here's a question, um, why don't we get pure liquid distillate if it's a total condenser, but pure vapor distillate if it's a partial condenser? So, this is by convention. So you, all I'm saying here is when you have a partial condenser, this middle one, what occurs is that you're only, um, 
you're, you're removing enough heat to condense some of the material, but not all of it. So that creates two phases, vapor and liquid. And, and the common way that this is used in industry is to get rid of some vapor. So um, this is not mandatory, but it's the, the, I guess the point I'm trying to make here with these two configurations in the middle and right is that once you go to partial condenser, you can either remove vapor um, or you can remove vapor and liquid. But you can't run a partial condenser and not remove vapor because then there's nowhere. You can't send that vapor back into the column because it'll just um, infinitely recycle. So, so that's the kind of key takeaway. Once you go to a partial condenser, you must remove at least a vapor stream. And then it's your choice, depending on the process, whether or not to send it back down, the liquid back down as reflux. That's going to be totally determined based on um, the specs of your distillation and uh, what's merited for your particular separation. Question came in, does the total condenser add an equilibrium stage? And the answer is no. So remember, when we take a vapor stream off the top of the column, as I'm highlighting here on the left, and we totally condense it, nothing has happened except we've had phase change. So in the most simple example, I have exactly removed the latent heat of vaporization uh, for the amount of material that went in the heat exchanger. And what comes out is a liquid stream that has identical composition to the um, uh, vapor stream entering that heat exchanger. And then we split it and we take some reflux back into the column and we take our distillate off. In contrast, um, if we operate the heat exchanger correctly and there's enough residence time and uh, mass transfer can occur so that equilibrium is established, by operating that condenser at a certain temperature, we will have another equilibrium stage. So that's why the partial condenser does create an equilibrium stage. So let's jump into this example problem and talk about how we do this analysis. This example problem will feature the partial condenser as well as a solution in which we're having to do the guess and check method. So just like we saw that with the absorber, that sometimes we have to do that uh, also in the distillation that can come up and I'll, I'll highlight that when we're doing it. But let me walk you through the problem and then I'll show you the solution. So um, a thousand kilomoles per hour of what we call NC6, that's a straight chain alkane, um, and NC8 uh, is fed to a one plate distillation column. And we have the, the ZF values there, so the, the mole fractions of the feed, 30-70 uh, mixture. And system is running with a partial condenser at one atmosphere. So we're given that the light key distillate component is 0 0.8 mole fraction, YD. Remember, it's a partial condenser. So um, we're taking off uh, a vapor fraction here. And I want to kind of just point out that just based on the molecular weight here, you should be able to identify that the light key is hexane, not octane, because it's going to have a, a lower boiling point. We're given that the feed is a saturated liquid. We're given a reflux ratio of two. And we're able to assume that the um, partial reboiler and partial condenser are all in equilibrium. And note that it tells you there's just one plate in this tower. So the goal here is to determine the distillate composition XD and the flow rates uh, B and D. So I'll walk you through how we do this, um, kind of using the same method and approach that I normally take. So the first thing we're gonna do is sketch the block flow diagram for the process and label all the relevant and known quantities. And uh, this is example 7.3 from your book. It's either defined in the problem or, or I've assumed that we're just taking off a vapor draw from the, um, the system here. So there, um, you may be wondering why there isn't a D sub V and D sub L stream. And that's kind of just given by the problem statement or assumed by me. If you needed to know that in homework or quiz, uh, we would tell you or give you the latitude to make that assumption yourself. So everything here is just labeled from the problem statement. What I'm going to do now is um, kind of draw each equilibrium stage and show the flows going in, in a stage-by-stage -stage manner. So let's just make sure we're all on the same page here. Uh, 
we're going to assume that plate one is the feed plate because that's the only place that we would really conceivably put the feed in. We know it's a saturated liquid. So instead of Z, I'm able to write X. So there's the feed of my light key, 0 0.3 mole fraction. And then there are uh, two additional streams entering and leaving plate one. So plate one is where all the action is. Um, we have a vapor stream leaving with composition Y1. We have a liquid stream leaving with composition X1. We have a vapor stream entering. And note here the composition is Y sub B because that is the, um, the composition of vapor leaving the reboiler. And we have reflux. We have a liquid stream entering with composition XR um, because we have a, um, a partial vapor condenser. So XR in this case, because it's not a total condenser, we'll, we do not expect it to be equal to Y sub B, which is the distillate composition, the vapor uh, light key component leaving the uh, one plate partial condenser tower. So this is good to do the first couple of times you analyze a problem like this because it, um, you wouldn't want to do it on a 10, uh, a 10 uh, stage tower, but a couple stages, you know, you should really be able to identify all of the flows in and out of each equilibrium stage and all the relevant variables. So um, I will always encourage you to do this when you come to office hours and have questions or want to or have uh, need some help. So um, step two, we're going to obtain the VLE and then label what's known uh, on this plot. So this is always how I would approach these problems. Hopefully you took the time to work through the notes uh, from last Thursday, and um, I, I showed this website, calcvle.com, where you can use um, um, calculate relative components uh, for common components in chemical oil and gas. There's some real drawbacks to calcvle.com, and, and remember that it's not an acceptable source for homework and projects. I could also have gone to Aspen. I, I could have gone to literature, but I was just wanting to kind of get this diagram uh, quickly for class. So uh, we got hexane as our light component, and this is a very ideal looking um, uh, VLE curve, though not perfectly ideal. So here, uh, there's two pieces of information that we know. We were given that the, the desired composition of the light key component in the dislip, actually three pieces of information. We were also given what is the feed composition? Um, 0 0.3 mole percent hexane, and that it's a saturated liquid. So we, we know that the, uh, I, I didn't terminate that at a specific point, that Q line, I just drew it up. And so um, we would eventually truncate it when it intersects with the operating line from the uh, rectifying section. So those are all, you know, kind of hopefully now concepts that you're seeing regularly and, and, and things that are not surprising to you. So now we're gonna draw the operating line slope um, and I'll show you a convenient way to do this on graph paper if it's not uh, something that's just readily um, available to you. But we were given, um, you'll remember in the problem statement um, that L over D is two so the reflux ratio is two. And so remember from your notes that the operating line slope is R over R plus one. And so the operating line slope is two thirds. So what that means is that I can start here at Y sub D. And since I'm on a graph paper, I can go over three and down two, and that will connecting those dots will create a line of slope two thirds. And then I can just extend that operating line down until it has an intersection with the Q line. So that's really the part, the portion that I need right there. So right now we've sort of gone through everything that's that's known from the problem, and and um, we know additionally that there are three equilibrium stages. What's missing, of course is the stripping section or the, the operating line for the reboiler. We don't know that. So the way to now solve this problem, the only way that, that is obvious to me to solve this problem is to guess 
at bottom's composition. So we're going to guess some value of XB, and then we're going to draw the operating line. And then we'll step off three, exactly three stages because that's given in the problem statement. And we'll see, because it's exactly three stages, it has to exactly match. It can't be a little more or a little less. Like we, we need that third stage to hit our initial guess of X sub B. Because again, this is a, pro, this is a design spec. There must be three stages. Um, so let's see what happens. Here's my first guess. And so I've made a guess of the bottom's composition of 0 0.25. So that's right there. Now that I made that guess, I can draw that stripping section operating line right here. And then once my operating lines are drawn, I can do I can start doing the, the, the stepping of stages. So I go here, down to the operating line, over to the equilibrium line. And then as soon as I drop down from stage two, I can see that I've missed it. So it's wrong. And this is also wrong right there. there that doesn't really mean anything. Um, I just kept drawing because it's it's very fun to just keep drawing those stages. So uh, guess one is wrong and my bottom's composition is way off. But by continuing to draw down, we can at least get some estimate, like maybe that's guess number two. So that's a value of about 0.08, I guess, um, 0.05. Okay, so let me zoom in here and show what happened. So you can see I took, I took that value, that value right there and said, well, we know that the third stage is gonna be somewhere down there, irrespective of the slope of the operating line. And let's use that as our initial, as our guess. So now, drawing my stages, I stepped down stage one, stepped on stage two, and now my color's changing to yellow. So I drew this twice because I wanted you all to see what this would typically look like on an exam if you just had one VLE curve. Um, and now this is my new guess two. I'm stepping over here, stage three, and I drop down. But you will see that guess two is still wrong. I'm not exactly matching the bottom's composition with the, the initial guess. So um, kind of zooming out, you can, if you already looked ahead in the notes, you can see that um, we now get it. So, so all I'm doing is kind of using my, my last miss as my next initial guess. And so I use 0 0.8. I hit it exactly right for three stages. So exciting. And now that I know my distillate and bottom compositions, here on this uh, highlighted section for this mole balance, I've labeled um, everything that's known in green. And we can see, uh, you've seen this balance before. I, I did this on the last example problem we did last week. Uh, we have all the knowns and unknowns, and then now we can solve for the bottom flow rate and the, the distillate flow rate and we can solve, uh, we've already solved for the, the bottom composition. So this solves everything that's been asked for um, in the problem. And hopefully now this kind of idea about why the guess and check comes up is clear. So the, the main takeaway, if you kind of watch this again, what happened was I got to a point where there were two unknowns. I didn't know the bottom composition and I didn't know the slope of the operating line. Um, and so I had to guess one of those things and then begin to see if that matched up with what I did know, which was that there was three equilibrium stages. So this is a good stopping point. Let's take a five minute break. So we'll come back at 1244. If you have questions, um, send them to Lynette and we will answer all the questions before we move on and start talking about energy balances and more complicated uh, separations. Be right back at uh, 1244.
Okay, I've got um, 1244 on my clock, a couple of questions about the problem, and then we will move on. So the first question is an interesting one. Um, is there any way to find XB, the bottom product composition, without using the assumption of the sort of optimum feed stage? And you'll remember that that means um, when we're using the optimum feed stage, we switch the operating line that we're using at the feed stage. So how could we solve the problem if we didn't automatically make that assumption that we were using the optimum feed stage? So I'll answer this in two ways. Um, the specific answer in this problem is that there's only one plate and we have the, the partial reboiler and partial condenser. So I think it's safe to assume there's only one place to feed the material into the column. It's not, um, you could find examples in industry where you are feeding a, a partial reboiler and then um, having some, some separation above that. But in this case, it was either stated, um, it was called a feed plate in the problem. You could go back and read the full problem statement or it was a, a safe assumption. Moreover, in general, we always use the optimum feed stage because that maximizes the driving force for separation. Then we know that that leads to the minimum number of stages. But just in case, you know, let's say we didn't know that or we, um, um, you knew that the feed stage was below the optimum feed stage. I think you would have to know whether it was above or below, but the problem then becomes a little under, um, under determined. And you, if you don't know where the feed stage is, then you have to do this guess and check multiple times and you're changing the feed stage while you're doing the guess and check. So it adds one more layer of thing you have to do when you're doing this process over and over again. So I, I think it's an interesting question to think about, but I, I don't necessarily think that that would be a practical question that would come up given that we know we want to minimize the number of stages and that we always do that when we have that optimal feed stage um, at the, um, the right moment when we, uh, line up our feed composition with those operating lines. This is another good question. Uh, if a column, if it is said that a column has three equilibrium stages, do we consider the partial reboiler and uh, partial condenser reboiler as part of the column or not? So um, would there be three stages plus two additional things, et cetera? So this is nomenclature about what is an equilibrium stage. So I talked about this last week, but I'll just really clarify again. Um, basically, our definition of an equilibrium stage is any place that equilibrium is established in the column. Um, So an equilibrium stage is not equal to a tray. So all trays that are 100% efficient or all chunks of column when it's packed, like a, a, a height of HETP, those are equilibrium stages, right? But there's other types of equilibrium stages. So um, the types of equilibrium stages that we, that we can have are the reboiler, uh, partial condenser uh, a tray a tray at 100 percent efficiency or uh, I'm going to write h for height uh, so one height of column that's HETP remember that's the height of an equivalent theoretical plate at 100 percent efficiency So th there's basically those are the, t t the different types of equilibrium stages. So you do want to be, um, sorry, this reboiler, these are, in my experience, all partial reboilers. We don't really ever vaporize everything down there. Um, so I kind of use reboiler and partial reboiler interchangeably. Um, there's vanishingly small cases where we boil everything in the bottom of the column. Um, and then, uh, that we typically would never want that to happen from an operational point of view because it would be a huge safety hazard. Um, but aside from that, um, it, it is correct to say it is a partial reboiler. So those are the different types of equilibrium stages.
Um, OK, I don't see any additional questions, so let's um, keep going. The last thing we want to do, um, two more things, energy balances. And I just want to briefly highlight how the Murphy efficiencies are used in our binary distillation problems. So. Sorry, just a timer there. A um, couple interesting things here. It, it's an outcome of doing the energy balances and kind of understanding how these systems work. But this is an important kind of um, outcome of the McCabe Dealey assumptions. Um, if you have a saturated liquid feed and you obey all the McCabe Dealey assumptions, your reboiler and condenser duties are going to be about exactly the same. So all bets are off when that's not the case. Uh, and you can do an overall energy balance on your column. Um, this should be familiar to, to all of you. So we have energy entering the column from our reboiler. And then that's the enthalpy of the feed multiplied by the molar flow rate of the feed. So those are energy flows in. Uh, it would be units of you know, energy per time, so kilojoule per hour or whatever. Um, and then you have four places where you lose energy. You can have uh, losses to the environment. You remove energy at the condenser. You have a bottoms product flow and an associated enthalpy. And you have one or more distillate flows and associated enthalpies of those distillates. So of course, energy is conserved. And some nice outcomes that your book highlights, and these are derived if you want to know more about how to get to these outcomes, um, are the following. that the the energy we call the the energy duty for the reboiler and the condenser, like what energy is required to achieve the um, that heating and cooling that we need. And there's three relevant relationships. This is only in um, the case of the McCabe Dealey um, scenarios holding, so do pay attention to that. In the case of a total condenser, so that was the first one that we did. Um, the enthalpy of vaporization is. Uh, multiplied by that quantity, D times R plus one. And you can work out that that's the amount of energy that's used um, if you substitute in the variable for R um, in order to condense all of the material. Remember that in McCabe Feely, there's only one enthalpy of vaporization because we assume they're equal. And likewise, in a part condenser, uh, it is known once you solve it how much material is condensed uh, and how much is left as vapor. And so you can derive this expression. And then um, we're going to use the boil up ratio in order to quantify how much material is uh, vaporized in the partial reboiler in order to calculate the reboiler duty. So these um, relationships shouldn't be surprising to you. I wouldn't expect you on the fly in, in class to be able to derive them, but um, they uh, certainly it's, you know, you want to be thinking about these calculations. So for a moment, the last moment, we're going to put ourselves on the other side of those heat exchangers and um, think about energy usage in columns in plants. I've talked about this several times this quarter. And it um, can't be stated enough that your design choices when you're building your column will make a huge impact in the profitability operations uh, and energy usage. So um, in a plant, we normally have this, uh, what's called a so the whole thing is our chemical plant, but they often talk about the uh, utility plant inside of that plant. So that's the place where um, you have boilers, you have giant pumps making compressed fluid, you're making your refrigerant there. And then those utilities are distributed throughout the plant uh, through a series of pipes. So um, when you calculate energy costs, you can find estimates that are kind of order of magnitude estimates for steam and water and refrigerant. Uh, but then they would be, as you refine your design or you, um, you operate the plant as a process engineer, you would know the actual literal cost of those, uh, those utilities for your specific context. So an important thing to think about, um, just as a good rule of thumb to have in the back of your mind, is that the cost of energy is not equal. Um, so steam, you may be surprised to learn, can be 10 times more expensive than chilled water to make. Um, so what this means is we shouldn't often rush to saturate, to feed our column a saturated liquid stream. And 
you often have in the area of your distillation column other reactors, maybe they're exothermic reactors that are generating heat. There's other sources of heat in your plant and you can be a clever chemical engineer and for example, partially vaporize your feed using some of that waste heat. Or you can operate your reactor in a way that would have a partially vaporized effluent out of the reactor. And this will reduce operating expenses because you're not needing as much heat if you're sending more vapor into the column. But in terms of understanding the requirements on the, um, the kind of tube side, if it's a shell and tube heat exchanger or the jacket side, the, um, the amount of steam that you need in your reboiler is, is gonna be uh, naively calculated by this relationship that you can find in your book. It's the molecular weight of water times the molar uh, enthalpy flow in the reboiler and then the, the molar enthalpy of vaporization for whatever saturated um, or superheated steam that you're feeding into that column. Likewise, the chilled water, the, these are often done, um, um, yeah, they can be done on a mass or mole flow rate. Um, typically in utilities, we're thinking in terms of mass, but it doesn't have to be that way. This relationship is, should not be surprising to you as well. We need the temperature drop in our condenser um, or the temperature increase in our condenser. So times uh, the heat capacity of the water and then, then we'll be able to figure out there what is the required flow rate of the refrigerant or material that's used for heating. Some columns do use an electric heating system if the flow rates are very low, but that's not typically the case in large scale chemical or oil and gas production because of the volume of the flow rate and the, um, the requirements and needs for electrical heating. Electrical heating also has much higher uh, maintenance costs. The risks of an electrical short are much higher in terms of the operability of your column. So it's just not, and, and by having an electrical heater inside your plant, you're creating a huge safety hazard because you could have a spark or a short and you often have very flammable materials. So it's just simply something that, that you're not gonna encounter very often in industry. Although in Chemi 437, one of the distillation columns does indeed use an electric uh, uh, mantle, heating mantle. Okay, so tray and stage efficiencies. Um, the same concepts of Murphy efficiencies exactly apply in our distillation analysis. So all fair game to give you liquid or vapor Murphy efficiencies and ask you to do the appropriate analysis. Always, always, always be thinking in terms of the approach to equilibrium. How close to equilibrium am I getting as I'm going from my operating line to my equilibrium curve? You have to take great care to understand whether you're getting the liquid or vapor Murphy efficiencies. And just as a rule of thumb, if you're stepping because of your problem solution, you're stepping from the top, so the distillate composition is defined, um, and you're using EMV, you're gonna have a guess and check type approach that we've covered, and I'll just kind of remind you here. And likewise, if you're using the liquid Murphy efficiencies and you're stepping from the bottom, there you'll need the guess and check approach. So um, here's an example of using Murphy vapor efficiency of 0.5, and you're coming from the top of the column, so you don't know where to start dropping down, but you do know that the ratio of this length here to this length here, so this um, first bar divided by the second bar, that's gotta be equal to 0.5. And so um, you may have to kind of draw a few times the spot where you drop down and then figure out exactly where it is that you will drop down. So that, that could be automated if you had an analytical expression for the VLE, I'm not gonna get into that, but um, that's how that works. Likewise, when you're stepping from the top and you're using a liquid uh, EML value, the so liquid Murphy efficiency, this is much more straightforward because you know, as you're moving from right to left here toward the equilibrium curve, you can exactly calculate or eyeball when um, you will get to a, say, for example, a value of 50%, given the example here that's on this slide. So that um, shouldn't be a surprise. It, it's very consistent with what we did in the absorbent stripper. And so just keep that in mind and um, know that that may come up. 
Uh, last thing we'll talk about in our graphical analysis, and this, this will conclude all graphical analysis of um, distillation columns, is uh, multiple feeds and side draws. And there's um, a couple things that are really kind of important to capture here. So just big picture, um, distillation towers very frequently have multiple feeds and or multiple side draws. So you're removing a product stream in the middle point of a column. In, in binary distillation, we don't often do this. There's not a lot of reason to do it. You know, we, we would frequently, you know, it, it's not impossible, but it's not, uh, not nearly as common. And um, the, big, the big picture that you just need to kind of introduce into your mind and think about is that each section of the column kind of gets defined with a new operating line. So instead of, um, you know, three sections where we had a Q line rectifying and stripping section, if we have one additional feed, it'll create one more operating line that we need to consider. So I'm not going to do a sample problem here. I'm just going to show you roughly how this would work uh, for two examples. So this is a two feed system. And this is just a block flow diagram that I drew and I labeled these three zones, one, two, and three. So we have the upper rectifying section, we have a lower stripping section, and this doesn't have a name anymore because it's in the middle. So um, depending on what we were doing, we may call that a, an upper rectifying or a lower stripping section, I don't know. Um, but what happens, um, let's say for the sake of discussion that this is two saturated liquid feeds, it'll make kind of this concept easier to, to get through. So I have an upper feed composition, ZF1, I have a lower feed composition, ZF2. And then I know it's a saturated liquid feed. So what that means is that as I move from the top to the bottom of the column, the liquid flow rate is going to increase, right? Saturated liquid. And the slope of the operating line will have to continually increase. So we would, with knowledge of these flow rates, be able to calculate what are these effective operating line slopes. and a question that could be asked would be, what is the number of equilibrium stages required to achieve this separation? Um, the analysis works just like the rest of the problems. It's just now a little more complicated. But what you need to do is kind of, like I always say, block flow diagram, write down everything you know, identify what is unknown, and then begin to approach solving the problem. So if you do that, these problems are no more difficult than the regular uh, graphical analysis problems that we've been doing. Likewise, um, here, let's say, for example, we have one feed and one side draw, and that the side draw is above the feed stage, so it's enriched in the light key, and that the side draw is going to be a saturated liquid, like the feed. So just the um, main thing to think about here is that since we're drawing a liquid out of the column, at the point of the um, side draw, the slope is going to go down because I'm, I'm removing a saturated liquid from the column at that point. And so you can clearly see that here, this inflection point where um, I'm going in my upper stripping section or upper rectifying section, and then my slope goes down actually as I connect to the feed stage. And then my slope will increase as I connect to the uh, bottoms product or reboiler because I'm adding a saturated liquid feed there. So you have the tools to sort of walk through these problems in the way that I just have. And that'll give you the ability to kind of on the fly do, do like quality control checking. Like, oh, I know the slope should increase or decrease. Is that happening the way I've set up the problem? And being able to have that habit will, will really facilitate you solving the problems well and, and being more successful in these problems. All right, so with the remaining 10, 15 minutes, we'll conclude talking about distillation and switch gears here. And what we're gonna talk about is multi-component distillation analysis. So beyond two components, because that's uh, out in the real world, that's the vast majority of distillation columns have more than two components, um, but we don't spend a ton of time on them in class because once you can do um, graphical and computer analysis of binary problems and you understand the principles, all those principles carry forward. So multi-component distillation columns still have reflux, 
they still have a relevant reflux ratio and the general patterns of behavior will also be true in those columns. Um, the general relationships in terms of the minimum stages, the, um, and things of that nature. So there are analytical methods that help you make an initial guess about how columns should be operated in the multi-component context. Last week, hopefully you took the time to go through the Aspen notes. Um, I really, if you haven't done that, you really need to, uh, to be successful on the project. But I talked about two different types of distillation analysis in Aspen. And the first one that I did was called the shortcut column in Aspen. Um, the shortcut column has an analytical analog called the Fensky Underwood Gilliland method. So three chemical engineers who worked in refineries uh, came up with analytical approaches toward uh, making these initial guesses for multi-component distillation. So I'm going to show you the highlights of the Fensky Underwood Gilliland method. We're not going to ask you um, to do analytical solutions of this on a quiz, but it's really important to understand what is going into this method because you'll be doing these calculations in Aspen quite a bit, these shortcut calculations. You can't really do the rigorous distillation until you know something about your system. So um, your workflow then in kind of real world separation design with distillation would be to use a shortcut method, whether it's analytical or whether it's in Aspen, get some initial guesses and estimates, and then you would do this rigorous distillation in Aspen, it's called rat frack that, that block, but there's other names for it as well, of course. So I'm um, gonna walk you through, there's three parts. Uh, each of those three people contributed something. So we'll talk about the Fensky equation of the Fensky method. And what we're doing there in the Fensky equation is estimating n-min. So that quantity, uh, if you noticed last week in the uh, Aspen, example that was one of the outputs of the shortcut distillation analysis with n min so it, it's it's really just a computer version of this really um, equation and an approach that i'm going to show you in order to do this you have to define the light key and heavy key components so this is just a screen cap of, a, of an example from your book but i want to highlight this because it students one or more students in my experience always get this wrong so everybody pay attention it's really important here is a series of alkanes. So we have isobutane, n-butane, isopentane, n-pentane, and then uh, C6 through C9. Those are probably blends of isomers. And n-butane and isopentane have been identified as a light key and heavy key. So these components are ordered in terms of their relative volatility or normal boiling point. If they're ideal, those are interchangeable. And you must select the light key and heavy key to be adjacent in volatility. If you don't do this, you're gonna have a middle component that just gets kind of smeared out on both streams and you're not really using the separation effectively. So this is an example from an output of a simulation. But what I'll illustrate here is that there is um, a, a non-trivial amount of the heavy key in the distillate, there's just a tiny amount of the next component heavier than the heavy key. And then there's really trace amounts or none of the rest of the components. Likewise, there's a, a measurable or non-trivial amount of the light key in the bottom product. So it's rarely the case that you get a perfect split of your light key and heavy key. And that's uh, reflected in the fact that uh, we need that information for the calculation of n-min with the Fensky method. So you'll remember that we use those light key and heavy key split fractions in the shortcut method. And actually that's what appears here in equation 912. So I'm not gonna go through this in great detail. The equation is straightforward. It's, it's um, just algebra, but it, it, what, the, what Fensky derived is this equation that relates these quantities here. So D and uh, B are the molar flow rates of the light key and heavy key respectively. And then this quantity here is the um, relative volatility of the light key and heavy key averaged across the column, or the geometric relative volatility from stage one to stage n uh, given here. So there's two ways to, to calculate those averages. You could um, average them across the column. This geometric average is probably more appropriate. Um, 
the, remember I, I pointed this out in the notes, what Aspen is ask, asking for is not these molar flow rates in the um, distillate and bottom product, but the so-called split fraction. So I showed you how to do that in the notes from last Friday. And if you're up to it, you know, when you're playing around in Aspen, you could actually calculate N-min using the Fenske equation and see how closely it relates to what is uh, provided by the Aspen solution. So that gives us N-min. The next part of the method is the underwood equation. So what happens here is uh, we achieve an estimate of R min. So the Underwood equation considers a column at a pinch point, and it identifies the minimum uh, reflux ratio required to achieve that. So here, um, L infinity is sort of like the um, liquid flow rate at an infinite stage, right? Remember, you'll remember that minimum reflux means that we have an infinite number of stages. I'm not going to, again, I'm not going to go into the detail of all these uh, specific variables, but what you need to do in order to use the Underwood equation, uh, it's a little more complicated than the Fenske equation, is analyze the system kind of at this pinch point, which you can do analytically if you know the VLE for the whole system remembering that this becomes quite a bit more complicated when you have lots of components. Um, if they're ideal components and non-interacting, it's actually not that hard. But all that to say is that given a distillate composition and given some knowledge of the VLE, you can make estimates at, of these relevant mole fractions as well as the relevant relative volatility of the heavy key and light key. Um, Component J here is the heavy key, and component I is the light key, just as a reminder in all of these analyses. So Underwood equation gives us R min. We already got uh, N min from the Fenske equation. And then the final thing is sort of scaling it to real life. And this will be the final thing I talk about, and then um, we'll, we'll kind of phase out here. So the, the Gilliland correlation, this is a totally empirical correlation. Uh, it gives either the actual number of stages, so you can get N, or you can get R, given that you have an estimate of N min and R min and N. And you'll remember when you did the shortcut method in Aspen, you had to specify one of N or R in order to get it to turn blue and move forward. So um, what you do, if you're sort of going from R to N, let's say that you had selected a value of R that you wanna analyze your column operating at, you would calculate this coordinate. So it's R minus R min. Um, let's say it was right here, a zero, 0 0.4. You would then use this Gilliland correlation to get this value here of N or of the Y coordinate, which is N minus N min over N plus one. And then you can back out the value of N. And you can do that in either direction going from the y-axis to the x-axis or vice versa. The real takeaway here, and this is an important kind of um, concept in, in distillation design, look at the very um, beginning of this graph. So what we see here is that as we leave R min, right? So in this axis, R minus R min, if R is equal to R min, so if we're operating at the uh, minimum reflux, uh, if we just increase the reflux ratio a little bit, we get a really big drop in the number of stages that are needed, right? We're going from infinite stages to minimum number of stages. And then the more we increase the reflux ratio beyond the minimum reflux ratio, the less bang for our buck we get in terms of the number of required stages. So you'll see in Aspen, that when you start playing with the reflux ratio, you wanna know where R min is because if you move way beyond it, nothing is gonna happen in terms of your, your effective separation or the effective requirements of the number of stages. Um, another way to think about it, so they, they plot this twice. Um, they also plot this on a log scale. So remember the axes go between zero and one. And so the, when you take the log of numbers that are less than one, you're gonna kind of flip the shape, but this is actually the same data. 
And I'm just showing you this figure from the book to highlight that when you compare uh, the gill and correlation, which is totally empirical, <laughs> to really rigorous data, so all those points are rigorous process simulations, uh, you get really good agreement. So this method, this shortcut method, um, I want you to be thinking about that as being pretty accurate. You're not going to beat it by a wild amount by changing all the variables in the shortcut method. It's really dialing in pretty closely what we need to do in terms of our separation. And then you can build the rigorous mass and energy balance and do analysis kind of going forward. I'm going to leave these notes here for you. Um, in terms of how to do multi-component complicated distillation in Aspen, you should keep this because you're going to do it in the future, maybe in Chemi 485, but I'm not going to go, this is just kind of an instruction manual, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it. So one more slide and then I'll finish up for the day. Um, moving forward, uh, we're going to spend probably two uh, full class sections where the equivalent of like a week of class in the regular quarter with three lectures, uh, talking about membranes, reverse osmosis and filtration. So this is a new mode of separation. Uh, we're leaving MSA and ESA behind. And then depending on how long that takes to get through, we will do some adsorption um, introduction and fundamentals of how pack bed adsorbers work, which are another really important separations technology. Uh, and also the basis for catalytic reactors, which you will talk about in the autumn with Professor Velo. So that brings me kind of right to 115. Um, I don't have anything else today. So this concludes class. You're welcome to step off the call and I can stick around for about five minutes and take some additional questions if there are any. I don't have much time though, um, but the TAs are also available. Talk to us on Canvas. If there's no other material, um, have a great day everybody and I will see you on Thursday in class. Looks like everybody's all set, at least for today. So I'm going to sign off. If you have any additional questions, just hit me on Canvas, send an email. Um, you guys all know how to find us. Uh, have a great day and good luck finishing up your homework and getting ready for the quiz.